Hello everyone, welcome back to another episode of r slash tales from tech support. In today's episode. Somehow I don't think a caution, exploding hard drive sign will really solve this one. In which my ovaries impact my ability to understand electricity. The two-step hurdle. I think I'm the only person this has happened to. Before we get started make sure to subscribe so you will never miss a video. So let's get started. Somehow I don't think a caution, exploding hard drive sign will really solve this one. Back when a disturbingly large amount of people liked IE and even used it by choice, I was working for a company that manufactured large metal things. We had been hard at work at a major IT infrastructure upgrade. It had all the usual trappings of such things, gripes from the users that dislike change and would just like DOS back thank you very much, gripes about the color of the new icons, gripes about everything. The IT team had been working hard at this thankless job for a long while, but it was getting to us all. Part of the project was replacing hundreds of PCs with newer models. This was resulting in enough hard drives to destroy that our previous destruction method was overwhelmed. So we had to find some other options. We didn't have the time or space to do something like DBAN on hundreds of PCs, so we needed something better and fast. I had recently been promoted to my first managerial position, and I applied my employee empowerment lesson and let my tech team brainstorm about how to destroy all the data on those hard drives. I had expected ideas about e-waste recyclers, etc. But no. Every idea involved using large, dangerous machinery out in the manufacturing area. Some of them carried a risk of death, and my team was most excited about those. Would an hour in, extremely hot industrial oven destroy the data? What if we dropped them into VAT of dangerous chemical? Or better, what if we threw them into VAT and watched chemical splash all over the place? Laughter from the team. Grimace from me. Maybe we could use some spare wire and build ourselves an e enormous electromagnet and wipe them that way. How about the acetylene torch? Maybe throw them at large spinning equipment and watch them get chopped to bits? Nah, the bits would fly all over the place. Even better. We could sweep up our hard drives when we're done. How about bats like in office space? No, axes would be better. What about the welders? Surely they could pulverize them somehow? No, the robotic welders. We'll program them to destroy the drives. Or maybe the laser cutters? Could we put them in a big pile, douse them with gas, and just light them all on fire? You can see this was going downhill or uphill, depending on your perspective, fast. Perhaps they were also enjoying making me squirm, particularly when they started with the pseudo-realistic ideas involving chainsaws. One of the PFY's pimply-faced youths, the youngest members of the team, ran off to go talk to his buddy on the manufacturing floor. This buddy was a jovial, burly, cynical, tattooed, leather-wearing Harley rider who would love to use expensive corporate equipment to smash other expensive corporate equipment to bits. Probably even more than the techs that had been listening to Upgrade Wines for six months. I liked the guy in the PFY, but I feared that the combination of adventure-seeking tech and danger-seeking equipment operator would get out of hand, and if we weren't careful, someone might lose theirs. Eventually when the techs ran out of steam with the ideas, I laid down three ground rules. 1. Nobody gets hurt. 2. Data must actually be destroyed. 3. Must be fast. Before too long, PFY returned with an enormous smile on his face, carrying two hard drives with large holes in the middle. We tried it on the ridiculously large drill press, and it cut through them like putty. What's this white liquid on them? Oh, that's the cooling liquid the drill automatically sprays on the things being drilled to keep from overheating. PFY and the rest of my team excitedly scampered off to the drill press to drill more holes in more drives. I went over and watched a few with, yes, a smile on my face also. But it all came crashing down when they tried the press break. 
Our press break was used to basically fold massive sheets of steel. I'm not talking thin sheets like tin or something. This was thick, hard steel, and it folded it like paper. My techs, or perhaps their equally entertained friends in the shop, had the idea of putting hard drives in the press break and bending them beyond recognition. Unfortunately it transpired that hard drives in a press break don't bend. Or, at least they don't only bend. They also explode. Bits of hard drive flew out of the machine and went an exciting dangerous distance. I wasn't there to witness, but my team was ecstatic about this effect. Unfortunately fortunately it was witnessed by a certain tight sphinctered person with a clipboard and a reflective vest, I've written about him before. Thus ended the festivities. Some on my team begged to keep doing it, saying it'll be fine if we just lay the drives down flat and we'll do it after hours, and even put up a safety sign. I said, somehow I don't think a caution, exploding hard drives sign will really solve this one. Since everyone involved had actually followed the company's safety policy by wearing eye protection and so forth, my team got away with a verbal reprimand, same with the equipment operators. But I had to officially forbid the team from using corporate equipment to pulverize magnetic-based non-volatile storage devices. However, managers were only there during business hours, but the manufacturing area ran 24-7 with multiple shifts. Some of my team, including PFY, worked an earliest shift to help out with early morning IT issues. I couldn't help but notice that the stack of drives with holes in them was larger each morning when I walked in and a poorly concealed grin on PFY's face as he said good morning each day. I grinned back and kept on walking to my desk. Better not to ask. In which my ovaries impact my ability to understand electricity. As some of you have noticed, I'm female. I don't usually catch flack for it, despite having a very mechanical job, and when I do, it's usually from other women, which just irritates me to no end. I think sewing is such quintessential woman thing to do, despite the fact that probably 25% of my customers are men, that a woman working on sewing machines just doesn't raise eyebrows. But every once in a while, there's that guy. This time, it was Mr. Brown. Mrs. Brown called, her machine was having some electrical problems, she thought, running up and down, her husband had been unable to fix it, could I take a look at it? An appointment was made for her to bring it in. Whenever I hear those magic words, I cringe. Just like with the plumber, etc., if the husband couldn't fix it, that generally means I have to undo whatever he did, figure out the real problem, and then fix it. When those words get used I charge by the hour, not the job. The next day, Mrs. Brown, a white-haired old lady with a cane, turned up at the door. Mr. Brown was right behind her carrying the machine. Mrs. Brown's machine had a knee controller. The difference between a knee controller and a foot controller is strictly down to user preference. You like what you like and don't usually like the other one, but there's no difference functionally. Mrs. Brown had had polio as a child and had braces on both feet slash legs and didn't have the physical ability to use a foot controller but did just fine with the knee controller. Then she told me not to plug it in until after I'd looked the controller. Okay, why not? Apparently Mr. Brown's fix had created enough of an electrical arc that she'd been knocked out of her chair when she tried to use it, and it had tripped the breaker and smoked the outlet. So I opened the knee controller, and there were solder burns everywhere. I don't know what Mr. Brown had done, beside the obvious crossing of something he shouldn't have, but he had gone back and unsoldered everything apparently without Mrs. Brown's knowledge. I plugged it and nothing. Mr. Brown had killed it. In the meantime, in the background, Mr. Brown is making nearly continuous comments about my gender and likely ability to fix anything, let alone anything as complicated as electricity and what I should instead be doing basically, anything at home having to do with dishes, laundry and kids. Mrs. Brown is shooting him increasingly lethal glares and finally, after a comment about, how is she supposed to fix it when I couldn't? She can't know what she's doing. Mrs. Brown, turned around, whacked him not gently in the shin with her cane and told him it was his fault they were there at all, 
and that he should go wait in the car he'd been quite enough help already, thank you. The expression on his face was comical, but he left. I had a spare knee controller and offered to sell it to her. She agreed, and I checked her machine in for whatever its original issue had been. When I called her three days later to tell her it was done, she told me she'd come get it in a week. He's going to hear about this for a while. Silly man always thinks he knows better than anyone else, and this time could have been bad. I still have bruises from falling out of the chair I am not young, you know and the electrician is coming tomorrow to check the wiring and replace the outlet in my sewing room. You just hang on to it for a bit, dear, and when his ears are good and burnt off, we'll come get it. A week later they came back. Mrs. Brown insisted I go into great detail about what was wrong with it, brushes worn into nothingness, carbon dust everywhere, and how I'd fixed it, new brushes, thorough cleaning, mostly, I think, to demonstrate to Mr. Brown that I did know what I was doing. Mr. Brown said nothing, just waited by the door. I don't care if you're friendly or not businesslike is fine. But if you can't be that, at least be civil. Or quiet either works for me. The two-step hurdle. I just had a fun phone call at work. We're a small IT support company with around 10 employees supporting all types of businesses small to medium in size. A user couldn't get into the terminal server remotely. She could enter credentials, get to the two-step authenticator hosted on the terminal server, but when she entered it the connection reportedly disappeared. We remote in and are looking into a few things and trying different things. Reset the remote login procedure, make sure she isn't still logged into the server, reboot the laptop she remotes in from and ask her to try again. And for a brief moment I see what happened when she entered her two-step code. She presses back instead of authenticate after entering the code. It was hard to spot initially because we don't see the cursor when the client moves it. When I asked her why she would press back instead of authenticate she got really embarrassed and apologized profusely. It's interesting what a few weeks of vacation do with people's workflow. I think I'm the only person this has happened to. I have worked IT in a K-12 school district for the past five years. I have to preface the claim I am about to make with some background information about myself. I am a male in his 20s and am unfortunately overweight, I swear this is pertinent info. Our district has been deploying and repairing Chromebooks for our one-to-one -one device program for the past two years, so needless to say, we are pretty hands-on with this particular device. The first of the happenings in this story came close to the beginning of one-to-one. -one. I was quickly repairing a broken screen on a Chromebook. After verifying the replacement screen lit, I stood up and lifted the Chromebook to chest level to place it in the done pile. I gave the lid a satisfactory quick close for a job well done prior to setting it down. I really want to know what astronomical alignment happened at that moment, because as it became apparent in a few moments, my left manbob aligned my nipple right into the path of the rapidly closing lid. The Chromebook almost made the usual satisfying snap noise as the lid made contact with the body of the device. But this time it was slightly dampened. It felt like someone had stuck my manbob with a needle and the heat of it spread to the entirety of manbub. It took me a moment to realize what had happened. I had snapped a Chromebook closed on my nipple. The polo shirt I was wearing offered little protection. I winced but kept quiet because there were like three other people in the office. I told my coworker later at lunch since we are pals, and I had to share how I beat the odds and somehow injured myself with a Chromebook. He laughed but didn't tell the others, so I appreciate that. As for the nipple, it was inflamed for about a week. This isn't the end of the story. Much time has passed, and I all but forgot about my lesson of keeping rapidly closing devices at least a half foot from my manbubs. Well folks, lighting does strike twice. Only this time it was a Dell Latitude 5501 laptop and my right nipple. 